Hello, I'm Scott Whipperman, the pastor here at First Presbyterian Church. And no matter who you are or where you are in your journey of faith, know that you're welcome here. We hope you enjoy today's service on this video, and we invite you to come join us for worship anytime that you would like, or join us in any of the other activities of the church. For more information about First Presbyterian Church, please visit our website at fpchelena.com or call us at 442-4775. God bless. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from Mark 6, verses 1 through 13. It's on the screen. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did you get this? Where did this man get these things? They asked. What's this wisdom that he that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And then they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as testimony against them. They went out and preached that many people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. The word of the Lord. Does the name Michael Gregory Rowe mean anything to you? He grew up in Baltimore's Kenwood Presbyterian Church. His Eagle Scout service project included reading aloud to students at the Maryland School for the Blind. He sang professionally with the Baltimore Opera. You might recognize his voice as the narrator on The Deadliest Catch. Could be you remember him from the Discovery Channel series, Dirty Jobs. In that show, Mike Rowe took on some of the most challenging jobs that varied from absolutely repulsive to seemingly impossible. While we watched, we wondered, how can a person do that job day after day? The world has a plethora of dirty jobs like cleaning the calf shed or the chicken coop on the farm. Veterans here this morning have memories of pots and pans on KP. Every now and then we see city workers mucking around in the sewer. Someone has to do it, but please, please, not me. Someone has to do it, please, not me. That probably is what God hears when a mere mortal, when you or, I, you or I get the call to be a prophet. Yes, somebody needs to be prophetic to go forth and proclaim what the Lord says. Somebody has to do it. Last month's General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA adopted a guide for honest patriotism. It defined honest patriotism as loving one's nation enough to correct its faults. Listen to this sentence from the guide. Just as the ancient Hebrew prophets stood up to kings and queens, 
So have Christians understood the prophetic calling to entail a moral freedom to challenge the misuses of power even within the church or the state themselves. As Christians, we are called to be prophetic, to be the conscience of our society and culture. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the church must be reminded that it is not the master of the state, nor is it, is it the servant of the state, but rather it is the conscience of the state. That is being prophetic, speaking truth to those who need to hear the truth. Our Old Testament reading is about God's call to Ezekiel. God was calling him to be a prophet with a special message for the Israelites. Ezekiel lived about 600 years before Jesus. He saw the destruction of Solomon's temple. He was carried away as part of the Babylonian exile. In the first chapter of the book named Ezekiel, he has an apocalyptic vision, a vision of fire, winged angels, and a chariot, and something that seemed like a human form sitting on a throne. When he saw this, what he said was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord, he fell on his face and he heard the voice of the Lord. The voice was sent in him to the people of Israel, a nation of rebels. You shall speak my words to them, the Lord said, whether they hear or refuse to hear, and the Lord told Ezekiel not to be afraid or dismayed. Centuries later in this morning's gospel lesson, Jesus went to the synagogue in Nazareth on the Sabbath. Jesus had a habit of going to the synagogue on the Sabbath, something we ought to emulate. He had been away for a while. Now Jesus was back where he grew up. The people there knew him. He was a hometown boy with a reputation as a rabbi, a teacher, a prophet, someone carrying a message from God. I suppose the fact that Jesus had been gone for a while, the fact that he was drawing crowds, a local boy making good, prompted the synagogue leader to hand him the scroll. As requested, Jesus read the day's lectionary. As expected, Jesus then provided some commentary at first, the congregation was receptive. He waxed prophetic. Then the town folk turned against him. How did he get so smart? They asked. Who does he think he is? We remember him when he was a kid before he went to the city and got all big shot. We live in a zero-sum status vigilance. For me to win, you must lose. For you to gain, I must lose. Too often, when watching another, especially a competitor or adversary, gain any honor or credit, we wrongly assume that ours is being diminished. Ego and competition inhibit our willingness to give credit or honor to anyone. We assume their gain is our loss. Perhaps those in the synagogue wrongly believed given Jesus any honor would take the shine off anything they achieved while he was gone. But that is not the way of grace. In the economy of God's kingdom, when we honor the deserving, we honor ourselves. Humility is a prerequisite for greatness. The people who turned against Jesus that Sabbath in the Nazareth synagogue were the people he grew up with. They remembered him as a kid. They knew him and his family, but they were unwilling to hear his truth. They were scandalized. What does he know? Who does he think he is? This scene led Jesus to quote a well-remembered saying, prophets are not without honor except in their home country. This brings to mind the story of a general, about a general presbyter, someone like Marcia Anson. This fictitional general presbyter was visiting a church one Sunday morning. It just so happened that a prospective preacher, a young person about to graduate from seminary, was also visiting that church that day. The general presbyter asked the seminarian if there was any interest 
in a short-term assignment to another church while its pastor was on sabbatical. Oh, no, not that church, said the seminarian. Why not, the presbyter asked. You know, the seminarian answered, that's my hometown, and we all know that a prophet cannot be honored in his home country. The presbyter responded, don't worry, my friend. Nobody is con going to confuse you with a prophet. <laughs> uh, that story may have some good humor, but its theology is suspect. In the Old Testament, God used prophets to speak out against wickedness, injustice, corruption. Sometimes prophets got in the face of kings. Think of Nathan with David, Elijah with Ahab, Samuel with Saul. Sometimes God inspired prophets to speak about future events. But it is important to remember what a prophet really is. Usually, a prophet is not a fortune teller. A prophet is always a truth teller. A prophet is one who says, thus saith the Lord. A prophet is one who challenges people to a higher standard, to a higher purpose. Not always the best way to win a popularity contest. And truth be told, it was not just prophets in their home countries who were without honor. Prophets were often not honored in any way, anywhere. They were rejected, despised, stoned, and killed. All because the truth of God is sometimes unpleasant. In Matthew 23, Jesus condemns the religious leaders and their predecessors for the shabby treatment of prophets throughout history. Jesus was not winning a popularity contest in Nazareth. His welcome was short-lived. Jesus was amazed by the lack of faith in Nazareth. We read that Jesus could do very little good in his hometown. He could not or would not perform deeds of power. We should not interpret this to mean that our faith or lack thereof limits God. Our faith or lack thereof does not limit our ability to do God's work. Faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains, but God will not shove his work down our throats. What happened or did not happen in Nazareth is not much of a surprise. These hometown people did not believe Jesus capable of doing anything great. After all, they knew him as a kid. In that regard, anything Jesus did would not be attributed to him or to God. Most likely these people Jesus grew up with would rather, rather credit someone other than God for any miracles Jesus did. You probably remember the story from Mark 3 some, where some of the religious establishment wrongly gave Beelzebub, the prince of demons, credit for the great work Jesus did casting out demons. In a wonderful twist, Jesus turns things around. Far from being undone by the treatment he received at the hands of his town folk, Jesus expands his ministry by sending out the disciples with more power over disease and demons than they ever had. There is a great irony here. The more the powers of this world try to tamp Jesus down, impugn his character, hinder his ministry, the more the Holy Spirit responds by sending out more workers to do even more miraculous things. And Jesus sent his disciples out to be apostles, prophets, to speak God's word. He sent them out two by two and charged them to take only a staff, a walking stick, no bread, no bag, no money. Jesus expected his disciples to live hand to mouth while on the road. They were to live off the hospitality of strangers. Where hospitality was absent, they were to shake the dust off their sandals and move on. In the Old Testament, Ezekiel, and in the New Testament, disciples and apostles were told to expect the rejection Jesus experienced in Nazareth. All through the Bible, we read of God 
using the least expected people to do his work, and very often the people involved weren't too happy about it. Moses said he was not eloquent, that he was slow of speech. Jeremiah said, oh my Lord, please send someone else. I truly do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. Peter and Andrew, James and John were fishermen. Matthew was a tax collector. They all became truth tellers, prophets. Nobody with any sense wants this job. Please not me. Maybe you've seen this very good sermon in a poster. Somebody has to do it. I am somebody. Is God calling you to serve in a way you've never served, to do something you've never done? There may never be a thank you or applause, but you, <clears throat> but you can share Paul's testimony from today's epistle reading that God will supply all you need to do what is being asked of you. God does not call, call the qualified. God qualifies the call. God's grace is sufficient. His power is made perfect in our weakness. God told the Old Testament prophets, Jesus told his disciples, and he tells us, don't worry about what you'll say or how you'll say it. The right words will be there. The spirit of your father will supply the words. In today's epistle lesson, the Lord told Paul, and he tells us, my grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. Our lives are filled with people telling us what we should think and who we should listen to. In many cases, we are misled by individuals who cannot wait to tell us about their own importance. They would have us believe that humility is a sign of weakness. Strength, on the other hand, is associated with power, and power is not only desired but sought after in this world of ours. But that was not the way of Jesus. The gospel subverts power. The power that God gave to Jesus was invisible to the people he grew up with. And yet Jesus did not become boastful and brag about the miracles he performed. Yesterday, Pearl and I watched Won't You Be My Neighbor? It's the movie about Mr. Rogers playing at the Myrna Loy. I recommend it. You should go see it, but take a Kleenex. As you know, Fred Rogers was an ordained Presbyterian minister. He was vastly different than most pr TV preachers. I believe he had a prophetic message relevant yet today. He spoke and lived humility, grace, and truth. In this morning's epistle reading, Paul says he will not boast of what he has seen and heard, so no one will think more of me than, it is, than is warranted by what I do or by what I say. Paul wants people to see and hear Christ in him. This is one way of determining if someone is prophetic, telling the truth. If it is for self-aggrandizement, for gathering power and attention, for promoting personal beliefs, then it is best to be skeptical. Often the truth is inconvenient. Every day we see living proof, truth has become less important than what it sells, or less important than what sells. Truth is less important than sound bites and twisted rhetoric used to push a certain point of view. But life in Christ is life in truth. We are called to speak the truth, but we must do so with care. Too often it is easy to confuse speaking the truth with judgment. Paul's phrase, speak the truth in love, has been misused over the centuries, used by people to say whatever they want under the guise of truth with little or no love. When we watched Mr. Rogers' um, Won't You Be My Neighbor yesterday, that became so apparent that whatever Mr. Rogers said, 
he said in love. Speaking the truth in love begins within us. Speaking the truth in love starts with telling the truth to ourselves, with obeying the still, small voice in our own hearts. We may not be called as prophets to nations. We may not all be called to get into the face of the president or the governor, but we are all called to be prophetic, to discern the truth, to listen to the truth, to speak the truth. Your prophetic call may be to advocate for ethics, values, and legitimacy at work or in the community. God's grace is sufficient. His strength is made perfect in your weakness. Truth living starts with demolishing our carefully built walls of convenient assumptions and half-truths. Once we begin to be prophetic with ourselves, once we begin to tell the truth to ourselves, we will be better able to hear the word of the Lord all around us. When we discern and live the truth, we can walk with God. When we live with the truth because his grace is sufficient, we can live with the truth because his grace is sufficient and his power is made perfect in our weakness. Very often the truth comes from sources we least expect. We are not certain who to believe. Remember the fable of the emperor's new clothes. Something was happening, and the truth was not part of it. And the least likely person, a child, saw through the scam. The truth disrupts our carefully designed theories, our carefully guarded prejudices, our convenient belief systems. The truth can threaten the very foundations upon which we have built assumptions about ourselves, about other people, values, politics, about everything. But we can live with the truth because God's grace is sufficient and his power is made perfect in our weakness. In John 8, 31, 32, Jesus said, If you hold on to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The truth will free us from the falsehoods, prejudices, and assumptions that limit our freedom to serve God and others. The people of Nazareth lost a great opportunity for truth by not listening more carefully to their neighbor and relative, who they knew only as the son of Mary. But we know Jesus, we know Mary's son as God's only begotten son, Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let us remain fresh and alive in our faith, seeking and speaking truth. Remember, God's strength is enough. God's peace is enough. God's love is enough. God's grace is enough. You are enough. Please pray with me. You have saved us, and now you call us to be prophetic, to carry your message to the world. Help us to discern your truth and apply it to our lives to answer your call to be prophets, to proclaim truth where we live, in our own skin, and wherever you send us. Amen.